Hi, and welcome to Film Forums. I'm Richard Williams, creator of this platform, a place dedicated to the filmmaking community. We interview members of the film industry to find out what it really takes to make a movie, bring a script to screen, or secure their acting role. If that sounds good to you, please subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on your favourite podcasting platform so you can be the first to know when an episode drops. Thank you. Hi there, welcome to Film Forums. My name is Aisha Zbeli and I have a very special guest with me today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Andrew Marcus and I'm a composer, sound designer, mixer from Four Score and Seven Music in New York City. Fantastic. So how did you get into going into the film aspect of, of music? Uh, I've always loved movies and always loved music. And I think I was maybe in high school where I started to get very interested in instrumental music. Mm -hmm. And then in college, majored in music composition, and I would write for different kinds of instruments, basically whatever we had, uh, string quartets and woodwinds and brass. And I became friends with all the musicians and they all played my music for me because I always wrote my music out neatly. <laughs> that was, I remember one time asking a, um, a flute player to, do a piece I wrote and she said that she couldn't, she didn't have time, she was really busy. And she opened up the envelope and she said, oh, everything's so neat. Oh, you have a schedule. Oh yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> um, and so being um, malleable and being organized is was a big help. I, I had a lot of interest in musical theater, which is a very American thing and studied at the BMI musical theater workshop which is an audition only program and graduated to the advanced level. And what I found was learning about musical theater made me a better film composer because I think in terms of story, everything's story driven, mm -hmm. character driven, story driven. It's not about creating music that is um, the kind of music I wanna write, but the kind of music a film needs and what makes a story come alive. And I have a little, a little saying, that uh, the purpose of music in a film is to make the story feel real, whatever that story is. And um, I always come from there. Where did your passion very much begin for music? Did your parents put you into music or was it something you gravitated towards yourself? Yeah, it started um, before I could even play an instrument, I would write songs and I'd build instruments out of wood or in rubber bands and things and just sing songs and write songs without even knowing how to play anything. Mm -hmm. And so when I got my first, uh, first lesson on the piano at about 11, the first thing I did was write a song. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, with and, uh, and writing always, I would have trouble uh, practicing the piano because whenever I would practice something, I'd make a mistake. And then I'd come up with some kind of thing of my own that I would, and I would go down that path. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So um, performing wasn't as big of a deal for me as writing was. It was, I, I really like being um, the sort of the, the heart and soul behind something uh, mm -hmm. visual. Yeah, rather than being like in the, in the limelight, in the spotlight, I guess. In the yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So do you sing as well? Obviously, if you're writing lyrics and things like that, do you, do you ever produce anything yourself or do you just always, you know, hand it over to someone? Well, I usually write instrumental music at, at, at this point, but I would always, um, I'd always hand things over to other people. Um, you know, one of the things in, in developing a career as a composer before having a, a, a it be my, my job, one thing I did was I was a teaching artist and I taught kids musical theater in New York City for many years. So I actually developed a decent voice by teaching kids to sing. So what's your approach when because you were saying obviously that the, the narrative, the story is so important, you know, for you creating the music and making sure that the music is assisting to move the story along because music is such a huge part, such a crucial part of any film, in my opinion, I'm sure it's yours as well, um, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> for obvious reasons. But I do think that that's often, the sound production is the thing that falls down in a lot of indie films. Yes. Um, but, you know, when you're approaching writing the music for the film, obviously you're inspired by the story, but do you also pull inspiration from other aspects of your life or other experiences and things like that? I 
Probably, <laughs> but I tend to want to see the world through the eyes of the characters okay. and, and keep a distance. I scored a film many, many years ago. Like, I think it was 2011. It, it, was, a, it was called Video Girl and it, it had Megan Good, who's a pretty well-known yeah. actress. And it was her vehicle and Ruby, it was Ruby D's last movie. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was scoring that film, I, my kids were just born, my twins were just born and my, and business is sort of having a little bit of a dip. So it was all this pressure of that and having kids. And I, and there was a certain, uh, like maybe sadness or, or stress or something that made its way into the music okay. of that. So when I, if I hear that music, I, I go, I, I feel that way, but that's the only time I can think of having done a couple hundred things that I, I brought my, the way I was feeling at the moment into it. I okay. usually try to keep a distance. So do you want to talk to us, obviously you mentioned there, you know, a film that included Megan Good. What other projects have you been on and, and what type of involvement did you have? There was another film a few years ago called Lost Cat Corona, which was an indie dark comedy with Ralph Macchio uh, from The Karate Kid and now Cobra Kai where he plays this uh, sort of pushover guy. And um, he he goes out on this adventure because his cat gets lost and he sort of finds his passion in life and his, his bravado. And Ralph Macchio is uh, really good in it. It's, it's uh, he, he did, he's not the Karate Kid. He's not um, any of the other roles I've seen him in and he was, he's just terrific in it. Um, mm -hmm. That's all over Amazon and um, you know any digital uh, distribution, but it was on Showtime for, for about two years, uh, the Showtime Network, which was nice. And um, last, uh, in April, something came out called Gravesend on Amazon Prime. It's a mob mini, it's a, it's a limited series about a, a, a young mob mobster who becomes a captain and his trials and tribulations and that came out in April of this year on Amazon. That that was really good. And uh, a film called Chronicles of a Serial Killer just got released in um, the beginning of October. That's mm -hmm. on all of the digital platforms. And it has some great actors like um, Dominique Swain and um, James Russo. It's a psychological thriller. It's, it's, it's really good. And it was a project I got thrown into um, that thrown into that makes it sound like I didn't love every second of it. I loved every yeah. second of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I got hired to mix it because the, it, there were problems with the, the quality control before distribution. Mm -hmm. And I was hired to remix it. And I just had this, even though I'd never met the director and we'd only had a couple of phone calls, I just had this feeling like, I know this guy, this guy. And I, I was a little bold and I, I wrote some music for it and mm -hmm. I said, look, I think your movie's great, but the score you have isn't, it's not quite right mm -hmm. for, for this film. I mm -hmm. said, listen to this. I did this cue on my own time. This is what I think your film should sound like. And he said, okay, score it too. Wow. And, yeah, and it was a- Yeah, really that's quite fun. a project to just stumble upon, you know, like, well, put your way into, which is great. I mean, if you don't ask, you don't get, well done. Yeah, yeah, you have to be pushy. It's not, that's not something that comes easy to me, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes you just believe in something and you go with what you believe in. And I, in this instance and others, I felt I could really make this, make this better. I yeah. can make something good, really good, or something great, a little greater. And um, it, it, it worked out very, very nicely. Um, yeah. But obviously people who... For example, you know, a young musician, a young artist that really, like yourself, loves film and loves narrative storytelling. When you started out, I mean, how did how do you find work? Like, for example, as an actor, I know that I go to Spotlight or I go to Breakdowns or I go to Action mm -hmm. Actors Access or I go to Mandy.com or something like that. For mm -hmm. musicians, what is, um, you know, where, where are your jobs? How do you come across them? Well, Mandy is a, um, something I haven't used in a while, but I, I did. There's another service, actually doesn't have that much stuff called um, 
oh my God, why did I just forget what it was called? Media match. Um, but I think meeting people has always been the best, the best way. Mm-hmm. Um, so for, you know, just for example, Lauren, I met Lauren McCann because she was at a friend's house, a mutual friend's house. Mm-hmm. Um, a, an old friend of mine from, from, for 20 years, he was doing a reading of his pilot called How Am I Doing? Okay. And um, which has also been, had a very similar life, like girl boxer on the mm-hmm. festival circuit. Um, and we met at my friend's apartment, we we're talking and she said, oh, I'm gonna need music for my, for my, my, my film, for my pilot. And we just kept in touch. And I don't think it was more than six months between the time we met and, and started to, to, do, the, to do the project. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So do you, um, networking opportunities, obviously that one, you, you know, you, you happen to, you know, share, share a common friend and things like that, but yeah. do you go to any networking events or film festivals or anything like that, you know, just to get to know yes. other filmmakers? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's been, what, what's a shame, a little bit of a shame was that it's, it was for, for me, it was a huge festival season. I had six, six projects in different, um, film festivals and, um, none of them really happened. They happened virtually. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> I probably could have taken advantage of that a little more in terms of some of the virtual events. Um, but I think getting to know people um, in person is, is, is really the best way. And then, mm-hmm. then you meet, sometimes you meet people. I had a, uh, someone I worked with on um, dozens of projects um, and I would become his go-to person so so every composer wants to be somebody's go-to or a few people's go-to because um once you develop trust and a track record with people and they know that you're going to do the best that you could do every time um it's really a lot less of a headache for the filmmaker there's a whole lot of hoops they don't have to jump through in finding someone yeah but they can trust you and they know that it's deliverable you know that you're going to come back with something good in a timely fashion and things like that as well you know so yeah um yeah I definitely agree I think well I mean from acting I've definitely been rehired by directors and producers and things like that so um I think that's really true within this creative industry particularly you do end up working a lot of the time with similar people and then you meet other people through those people and that leads to other jobs you know yeah so um, exactly yeah now there's another controversial topic that I wanted to talk to you about Mm-hmm. What's your take on, for example, working for free to begin your career so that you can build some kind of portfolio and get credits? Do you think that that's um, kind of a rite of passage or do you think that you should always be paid from the get-go, whether you can pay your credits or not? I think that I've worked, I've done a ton of things for free. Mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I don't think it's a, see, there's, money isn't the only currency. Sometimes you do a job for someone that doesn't have the money, develop a bond, a friendship. Um, mm-hmm. They can turn you on to other people. They can recommend you. Um, it's, uh, I would rather get paid a little bit of money mm-hmm. and work for in a small window of time than not work for a small window of time. So uh, I, I think if you're just starting out to work for free or to work for cost, or even if someone gives you a hundred bucks to do it and you can get a new plugin for your system, I think it's worth it. I know when I started acting, I did all, a lot of free work as well, um, mm-hmm. just to get a showreel because without a showreel, you can't get paid work. You know, it's quite difficult yeah. to do that. Um, and I guess it's similar. You would need some kind of reel as well to show what you've done previously. Um, yeah, absolutely. After I'd done a few things and I had a show deal and I was starting to get some paid work, I then was like, okay, I may accept other free projects, but only if I love the the script and only if they can guarantee me an IMDb credit. If I'm not mm-hmm. going to get an official credit and it's not going to go anywhere, then I'm not wanting to do it. You know what I mean? Because yeah, I want yeah. to make sure that I'm getting something valuable. And then I would also be like, okay, how likely are they to go into film festivals? Am I going to get visibility from that? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you went through a similar process as well, you know, with your music where you kind of ramped up the levels of what you were willing to accept at which point in your career, you know? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 
keep progressing and you and you you want to get better quality projects and you want to get better um, paying projects just because when you get a little older you have more needs um, I, you know I have a family so um, they love to eat yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. so in terms of girl boxer how did you come up with the score for that Lauren was talking about the idea of a slip jig very Irish and so that really is where it all started um, and I think I started with the fight scene where that kind of sound it's it's sort of um, it's like filmy rock uh, cinematic rock um, and that the, the boxing scene at the end is my favorite my second favorite scene is when the two brothers um, come to meet each other, uh, Jack Mulcahy and David Sittler. Jack is the, David Sittler's the one with the beard and yeah. Jack Mulcahy is the clean shaven guy. Jack okay. comes in, yeah, yeah. But, you, but you don't know that um, they, they, they have this sort of stone-faced look at each other. We don't know their brothers and they exchange this glance, there's this real tension when the doorbell knocks and there's an ominous tone and then they hug and then there's this Irish pan flute mm -hmm. uh, and warm, warm uh, feeling that, that comes through music. That was also, that's probably even better than the fight scene because the fight scene's more, more obvious. But, but Lauren came from just this idea of the slip jig, this Irish folk music, and then, um, and it needed to rock out a little bit. It yeah. needed to have an edge. Um, yeah. It was kind of like almost like a fusion, if you know what I mean. Um, I it's funny because it stuck out to me like so much. Maybe because Scottish, Irish, you know, we have quite similar music, you know. But straight away, I was like, hmm, I'm watching an American film, but this sounds Irish. Like it's straight away <laughs> gave me like that that feel to it. And obviously, the characters are, are clearly, you know, Irish or from an Irish background and so on. So. <laughs> It definitely adds to their character. I think that you did a superb job there and like really bringing home who they are, you know what I mean, and where they're coming from, you mm -hmm. know. So what do you feel is next for you, you know, in terms of your career within film? Um, well, I'm starting a new project, um, okay. well, rather a new program. So um, with projects like Girl Boxer and How Am I Doing and, and several others, I noticed that I was working with, I was doing these really strong indie projects mm -hmm. that were often women driven, Either, like in the case of Lauren and How Am I Doing was directed and produced by a woman. And there was a couple of other great festival projects like um, a, a short called Always Written, directed, produced by, by women. And so I created something for my company called The Equity in Film. If, if someone who's a minority, a woman, or LG, um, LGBTQ uh, director, producer, or writer wants to have their sound done, I review the film, not like a critical review, just uh, what needs to be done. Yeah. And then I basically do it for cost. Wow. Um, yeah. That's amazing. That's so lovely to hear. Um, yeah, so basically any, you know, less represented groups. So does that include, you know, like ethnic minorities and things like mm -hmm. that as well? And yeah, that's absolutely. Fabulous. Yeah, that's really nice to hear because it is yeah. hard for um, women and especially women of color. I'm North mm -hmm. African myself. I know I have a Scottish accent, but I'm <laughs> both. Um, so it can, you know, it can be very difficult, I think, for for you to connect with the right people or, or to even yeah. get your projects, and, you know, just to get your project out there. So where can people, you know, apply for that or find that? Um, it's on the website, www.fourscoreandsevenmusic.com. Okay. It's the number four and the number seven and everything else is spelled out. Okay. And there's a, a page on the website called the Equity Film Program. And it has the, basically the application or questionnaire. Mm -hmm. um, and I just did a very short project called America Rise. It's, it's more of a, it's a very experimental film. It's only about six or seven minutes. Um, I did that through the program. I'm about to start a, um, uh, 
I, I guess it's a pilot or a proof of concept um, called Glass House, which is a political uh, drama, really, really okay. interested, uh, in, I'm sorry, interested, interesting um, story. I don't want to give away too much, but mm -hmm. I'm about to start on that. Um, and it's just, there's just so many awesome stories from the underrepresented voices. I completely agree with you. That's one thing that I'm focusing on as well within this podcast. I'm trying to make sure that, um, well, not just myself, but me and Richard, we both feel very strongly about making sure that there is representation. So we want, you know, people of color, we want, you know, people of all different backgrounds, whether it's LGBTQ or that, you know, they're uh, a woman in film, you know, all these sorts of things. We want to increase visibility for the underrepresented as well as you know having in anyone anyone else as well you know i mean it's not that we want to exclude anyone else right it it's, it's, it's true but, you know but and you know and the thing is when you have when you have underrepresented people mm -hmm. and you see the the different looking faces mm -hmm. um and the different skin color they still have the human experience that's this we all have the same human experience uh, obviously we have different human experience, but we all hurt, we all love, we all yeah. um, value family, community. Mm -hmm. um, and so through the diversity, we find the thing that's in everybody, the things that are common in everybody. Is there anything coming out really soon that we could, you know, watch or, and listen to <laughs> and, you know, get into? Sure. Um, the, basically, the Chronicles of a Serial Killer, which is on demand and on demand and um, all the digital platforms and Gravesend is on uh, Amazon Prime. There's a, a really nice short I did called Black and Blue okay. that it's black and blue, not okay. and, but and. And that's, a, I guess, a 12 or 13 minute short on, um, um, it's about uh, cops being blue and black Americans being the black and that whole thing. Okay. That's on Amazon Prime also. Wow. Um, and there is one other thing I do. Um, it's called Film Music Mentor. It's a YouTube channel. And I give um, stories and advice about how to use uh, music and film and how to avoid uh, all kinds of issues like legal issues and mm. um, common mistakes that that people make with music and just to create a better dialogue between composers and filmmakers. And that's on, it's been on YouTube for a couple of years. Um, it's Film Music Mentor. Um, if you just type that into YouTube, it'll pop up. There's, I think about 50 videos wow, and okay. about to come out with a whole bunch more. So if um, anyone's interested in learning about how to communicate better, um, how to find a composer, what questions to ask, the difference between a songwriter and a composer. Um, th there's a wealth of information. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. That's a great thing to hear and we'll definitely promote that alongside you know, this interview as well. Um, thank you so much. I, yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic um, wealth of information there for, for people who are coming up or, you know, and if you're coming up, just just keep doing it. Meet people, write music, fail, learn. It don't I think the one thing for anybody who's creative, don't worry about achieving everything in your first project. You don't have to make the funniest, most dramatic, scariest um, political film ever in one one film. You let your career be a, a, a wealth of diverse projects and expressions. Um, don't worry about doing everything at once.